Hi, welcome to the Viz Center. My name is Kevin Robinson. I'm a geologist here at San Diego State University and one of the many science advisors for our X24 simulation. There's many people behind the scenes that are helping out and thank you to everybody who is involved. There's a big volunteer army behind uh, this production. This video is designed to give a basic understanding of the X24 disaster scenario. This is an environment where uh, everyone is invited to play. It's a no-fault environment. You kind of get out what you put in. Uh, we hope that we've provided a constructive space for dialogue and communications about best practices following uh, or preceding a disaster. Uh, this space is designed to help us make better decisions before, during, and after uh, a future event, and also to minimize the extent of the crisis. The X24 simulation creates a hypothetical situation to demand our attention and focus. The specific events that occur during the exercise are not what is important. What we do, who we meet, and what we learn from this overall experience is what we're after. Response during a crisis involves a host of people where communication, group decision making, and a concerted effort is required. This is only an exercise. We are not making any predictions about the future, but we have learned from past disasters that unexpected things will happen, or a series of unanticipated separate events results in a more significant disruption. No matter how much you prepare, the exact course of events could be surprising. The goal of X24 is to foster preparedness among organizations and individuals by sharing knowledge and establishing relationships. Our efforts are geared to help disaster victims and to save lives in emergency situations. It is clear that organizations can benefit from this kind of learning exercise as they discover their weaknesses, strengthen their resiliency, practice group decision making, and reduce the downtime following a catastrophe. For businesses, the goals might include safety of personnel, supply chain protection, and the potential to save lots of money. In other words, there's some big benefits that can come out of this at a very low cost. We welcome your participation and feedback and hope you find X24 Mexico a productive experience. One of the things that guides geologists as we understand uh, how the world works is a concept called plate tectonics, which is fundamental to geology just as genetics is to biology. It describes how the outer shell of the Earth's surface is broken into large moving blocks that are driven by the motion of the mantle below. When these large plates of rock slip suddenly past one another, they generate earthquakes along a crack in the crust that is called a fault. Mexico has a very large underwater fault along the Pacific coast, extending south from near Puerto Vallarta into Central America. Big historic earthquakes like the 1985 8.5 magnitude event have been located on the deep sea trench that's formed by this fault. These big earthquakes will occur when the dense ocean floor suddenly slips below the edge of the continent. Because the ocean floor can move during these types of quakes, they have the potential to form tsunami. In addition to earthquakes, this process of subduction generates underground pools of melted rock called magma. A volcanic eruption occurs when this magma rises to the surface. The volume and character of that magma will determine the type and severity of the eruption. The probability of an earthquake can be forecast but not accurately predicted, but volcanic eruptions are different. They're more predictable as that upward rising magma and the changes to the volcano are quite detectable. In this hypothetical X24 exercise, a large earthquake has occurred along the Middle America Trench. The ocean floor faulting in this event is large enough to form a tsunami. The earthquake has also energized the magma system in one of Mexico's large volcanoes, and a short time later, a significant short duration eruption begins. When the crust slips along a subduction zone like the Middle America Trench, seismic waves are formed and they race through the overlying crust to impact the people and the structures on the surface. The largest of these subduction-related earthquake events is referred to as a megaquake, and these can exceed magnitude nine, and they can shake a regional area for many minutes. Two recent examples of megaquakes with large tsunami include the 2004 Indonesia and the 2011 Japan events. For our X24 pretend quake, we have broken the Middle America Trench south of the port of Manzanillo. An 8.0 earthquake has formed at shallow crustal depths, and this has resulted in uh, violent seismic waves uh, that last for about 90 seconds. 
The seismic waves are oscillations of the Earth that accompany the sudden movement along faults. There are several different types of seismic waves. But they're formed as the uh, energy that has built up in the crust over the period of time since the last earthquake is suddenly released, kind of similar to how a golf club snaps as it hits the ball. Seismic waves propagate out from this zone of rupture, moving up to five kilometers per second. There are several types of these waves. Usually the most damaging kind are those that move the ground side to side and input shearing stresses into buildings or other structures. The kind of rock that is present below a city will have a big effect on the degree of damage. Sedimentary basins and less solid rocks can amplify the waves and increase the length of shaking. When buildings shake at the same period as the seismic waves, a destructive phenomena called resonance can occur, most dramatically witnessed in the 1985 Mexico City event. The general rule is that earthquakes don't kill people, buildings do. So structural and engineers continue to make buildings better able to withstand these seismic waves. During the earthquake, the movement of the sea floor can input kinetic energy into the ocean water and generate a tsunami. These fast moving ocean waves are relatively benign until they move into shallow coastal waters. As they slow down from about 500 miles an hour to about 40 miles an hour, they become much bigger. The speed is less important than the mass of the water behind the wave and how the coastal features and the ocean floor have concentrated that energy. A 1.5 foot wave can drag a person off their feet. A 10 foot wave can demolish a wooden house. As seen in Japan in 2011, harbors and low lying areas can be severely impacted. A tsunami can last several hours as wave after wave hits the coastline with an average period of roughly around 20 minutes. Based on recent history, earthquakes can form tsunami as high as 30 meters or close to 100 feet. The first tsunami wave can arrive within minutes or up to an hour after the earthquake. The initial warning to prepare for a tsunami is the earthquake itself. If you're located at sea level and experience an earthquake lasting longer than 30 seconds, it is your warning to find higher ground. In Japan 2011, large and strong concrete buildings can withstand a tsunami wave up to 10 meters high. Also in Mexico is a chain of volcanoes called the Trans-Mexican Volcanic Belt that stretches from the Pacific Ocean to the Gulf of Mexico across the country. This volcanic belt is formed by the subduction of the ocean crust off the Pacific coast. As those ocean rocks are subducted to depths down in the earth, they are heated, and the carbon dioxide and water that are contained in those rocks is cooked out, and this accelerates the melting of those hot rocks at a depth of about 100 kilometers. As this subduction melting occurs, the resulting magma rises upward, and various changes and interactions result in an explosive brew. The amount of magma determines the size of the eruption, and the chemistry of the magma determines how explosive it will be. The last devastating eruption in Mexico occurred in Chiapas at a volcano called El Chichon in 1982. This eruption killed about 2,000 people and was about three times the size of the eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980. Several volcanoes in Mexico have had smaller eruptions more recently. Volcán de Fuego near Colima and Popocatépetl near Mexico City have both been active over the last decade. Popocatépetl awoke from a 75-year slumber in 1995 and is currently considered active. Pre-Hispanic eruptions devastated populated areas around the volcano and greatly affected the valley near Puebla. Close to the volcano, the falling rocks and hot rocky avalanches are extremely dangerous. The silica ash emitted by the volcano can cause hazards close by and at greater distances. Ash in the presence of water can form mud flows, which we call lahars, and can devastate populated areas downriver. The volcanic ash is very unhealthful and potentially deadly to breathe making human movements difficult. The best safety advice for a volcanic eruption is if you're not nearby it, to shelter in place and stay out of the ash. The ash is also damaging to engines, causing them to fail and thus restricting air operations and ground-based transportation. It's quite possible that a large eruption could shut down air traffic over an entire continent. So welcome to the X24 environment. We hope that everyone has a constructive and positive experience. 
for everyone that is part of the project and all the people behind the scenes and in the entire volunteer army, we thank you for participating and look forward to your feedback.